Good morning, y'all. Welcome to Church of the City. Let's stand on up together this morning. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God.
darkness we were away without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt So praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three and one, God of glory, majesty, oh, praise forever to the King of kings. the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died so we praise the Father we say we praise Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, the God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the Lamb of conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of those who come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the Spirit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not heal and shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, he has resurrected in me. So we pray. Just 
for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory you're worthy of it all Jesus you're worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory sing praise the father so praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three
Lord, you are the highest. All of your thoughts and all of your love, it, it reigns. And we see you and we hear you and we feel you. We ask that you will help us to stay in this place, to stay fixed on you, to land right here, right where we are in the community and the family that we are in. And we ask that you help us receive you over and over again. That's who I am. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you would just turn for a few seconds, greet a neighbor, somebody you don't know yet, shake a hand, hug a neck. I thought you said you're on the phone. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church of the City downtown. My name is Matt Smallbone. I'm the lead pastor here. Thrilled that you're with us. Uh, it's Palm Sunday, and, and now begins the journey for Jesus uh, towards the cross. And I just want to update you on a few things that are, that are coming our way this week. Um, on, on Good Friday, which is this Friday, April 15, between 11:30 and 1 p.m. this this room is going to be changed uh, to a space of, of deep reflection. Um, we're, we're hosting an event, leading an event called Journey uh, to the Cross. It's kind of an event in which you don't talk, you read and reflect at each station in the room. Uh, with the goal being that you, would, you connect with the heaviness uh, of, of the death uh, of Jesus. So the room is available to us between 11.30 and 1. I think if you were to race through it, which I highly do not recommend, you could do it in 20 minutes. Um, I think probably the over-under is like 35, 40 minutes, and, uh, and, peop and, uh, and other people just, just sit at the foot of the cross uh, as part of that uh, for, for over an hour. So I uh, encourage you to come to that. Um, obviously, the content of, of Good Friday, uh, you got to parent your way through that if, if you have kids. Um, I'd encourage you uh, to be part of that. One thing you may want to consider is come at 11 a.m. for a Kids City uh, walkthrough that will be hosted by Miss Courtney. So we're going to reserve the room, uh, especially for the kids' experience from 11 to 11.30, and then for the rest of us, it's available between uh, 11.30 and, and 1.00. Um, and it is just such a, I, th I think it's one of the favorite things that we do, actually. So I encourage you to, to join us for that. And gosh, your spirituality is incomplete if you go from this, this Sunday, Palm Sunday, straight, straight to the resurrection. There's, there's some uh, work to be done between now and then. Uh, and then, which brings us to next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, April 17. Uh, we're sticking with our two service times, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, you need to let your friends know. We, we anticipate we'll have more people here than we've ever had before, before uh, in this space. We have new parking lots. Stay connected with our socials uh, for all of that. Um, but, you know, our, our guarantee to you always is there's, there's free parking uh, available uh, around here. Um, I want to encourage you to take a risk and, in, and invite someone along to, to that service. Um, guys, 20 and 30-year-old Americans are staying away from church in, in record numbers. Easter Sunday is one of those Sundays in the year where I think what's happening is, is, is people aren't missing church, but they deeply miss Jesus. And, and I think it's one of the easiest invites of the year um, where you can invite someone back into a community to learn about Jesus. I have your deconstructing skeptical friends in mind all of the time, um, but especially on, on Easter Sunday. I promise you to the best of my 44-year-old ability, I won't embarrass you. Um, and we, we will have your friends in mind and create a super safe place for them to come and sit with our, introduce them to our beautiful community. So I encourage you to be brave, maybe even, you know, just take, take all the barriers away, offer to pick them up, uh, drive them here, grab brunch afterwards. Uh, with, with it being such a, a massive Sunday and also a holiday weekend, we do need some volunteers specifically for Easter Sunday. If you'd like to be a part of that, um, join our parking team or our hospitality team, perhaps. Um, 
could, could you let the folks know at our connection table at the back of the room? Um, or you can connect through cotc.com slash Easter, Easter, and uh, just, just click check the, the serve button there. Um, I do want to say, if you are new to Nashville and you, you're dreading Easter a bit this year because all of your typical rhythms that you did with your family or whatever aren't available to you, why don't you join our family uh, on that morning? You will need your 30, 40 minutes uh, before each service. And uh, what you will learn is that while a lot of our people uh, start serving because it just feels like it's the right thing to do as a dutiful Christian, um, they end up having the time of their lives. We've got a great community of folks who, who get here before church. So especially if next week's feeling lonely for you, I, I challenge you to join us. Uh, let's, let's, let's dig in on this together and welcome a bunch of new people uh, to our church uh, on Sunday. Two days after Easter Sunday, we're, we're launching a, a new growth group called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It begins on April 19. You can, set up the, you can sign up at the Connect table after the service, and you'll be given a, a book to read. Actually, before that first uh, meeting on the Tuesday after Easter, like we, it's, it's encouraged that you read Chapter 1 of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Uh, of, of all of the, the books I've read uh, and content I've engaged with over the last 10 years, uh, Pete Scazzaro's Emotionally Healthy Spirituality uh, is, is the one that has caused the deepest change in me. It, it, it occurred to me that I'd spent most of my adult life trying to follow Jesus and deeply uh, emotionally unhealthy. And it should not be true of the church that, that people come to church for decades and, and, and they don't know how to handle their relationships or, or, or their emotions. And uh, I can't recommend this course more to you. And, and so you can sign up either online or at the back of the room today. It does cost $40. If that's a barrier, we will, we will solve that for you. Uh, finally, it's, it's our time to give. One way to give is through cotc.com slash give, select downtown, um, and that's a way to give online. We also have a maybe even easier way. We have a giving box uh, placed on the connection table at, at the back of the room. And uh, we appreciate your faithfulness in giving. Uh, there have been, as you can imagine, so many needs in, in our church, in our city, and across the world uh, over the last two years. And, and we, we have been able to be uh, remarkably generous. So we appreciate all that you do in that regard. Could you stand together for the reading of God's Word? This is uh, coming to you from John 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is, is not to end in death but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. This is God's Word. Why don't you take a seat? And ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I want to welcome one of my favorite people uh, to the stage to, uh, to do a wonderful job of opening God's Word this morning. Um, I learned some things at the 9 o'clock service that I didn't know before, and that's about as good as church gets for me. Could you welcome, uh, with all the warmth in your heart, uh, Mr. Denny Heiberg. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Good morning, church. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> okay, then. Do you have any questions? Can you, can you only imagine what Martha and Mary must have felt when their courier that took the news to Jesus that their brother was, was weakening before their eyes, and that courier comes back empty-handed, and then he doesn't show up for another two days. So here's what I want to do. I want to invite you today in these brief moments to put yourself in the sandals, in the robes of those precious people that were surrounding Martha and Mary during this chapter that we're going to unpack today. A number of years ago, I 
I was seeking for a, a spiritual director. I'd heard great things about these type of people that they, they're not counselors, but they help you listen to what God might be saying to you. So I asked, knowing that many of them come out of the Catholic Church, I asked uh, the pastor that was just down the road from us uh, if he had a suggestion about a spiritual director. And he said, well, if she wasn't on my staff, I'd go to Sister Beatrice. I said, sold. <laughs> and I'll never forget my first time with Sister, Sister Beatrice. We were in her tiny office, and she sat down in front of me, and she had her Bible on her lap, and, and so did I. And she said, Denny, go ahead and read. And so I read a particular story. And here's what she asked me. Denny, where are you in the story? And quite frankly, I had never been asked that before. And I said, well, I think I know what you mean, but I, I'm the invisible observer uh, behind the crowd watching this. And she said, no, no, that's not what I'm asking you. Where are you in the story? What, what character do you identify with? And it changed the way I read the Bible from that point on. So, if nobody's ever asked you that before, you won't be able to say that after today. Where are you in the story? Who do you identify most with? I want you to see what these people see. I want you to, to hear what they hear to feel what they feel, and to even smell what they smell as we begin this journey. And as it, at the outset, you know, sometimes when we think we got Jesus figured out, he does something different, <laughs> something that we don't understand. In the language of the game I, I love, he throws us a curveball when we're sitting on ready for a fastball. And that's going to happen again today. I trust these last six weeks of our journey through the signs of Jesus, through the Apostle John, have been a, a transforming time of discovery for you. As we focused on each one of these signs that has revealed the, the power of God working through this Jesus, God's anointed king in human flesh. And I hope that John's clearly stated purpose near the end of this gospel has, is becoming true for you. I want us to just reflect on it briefly. Let's take a look at, at John 20, 30, and 31. John seems to wrap up his, his account by this. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, you notice that we've we bolded three words there. These are very, very important words to the entire gospel account, unique from, from Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. These three words stand out. John uses the word sign. He never uses the word miracle. Never in his entire gospel. He calls it a sign, simeon. It's a, it's a word that takes us deeper beyond the actual power of the miracle and points us deeper into something that God wants to, to reveal to us. Uh, for those of you that may have been in our essentials class uh, during our time of study, we, we talked about looking at the Bible and, and seeing the surface but then going deeper into the levels of the author and what the Holy Spirit might be revealing to us. And that's what John is doing through these signs. It's a deeper spiritual truth. And you know, uh, perhaps the, the three primary purposes of signs are to give us information, uh, to identify, and then to direct us. And that's what these signs do, and they lead into our, our belief. And as you've heard Pastor Matt talk about belief, it's a, it's a process, it's a journey. First, we acquire information, we acquire knowledge, and then we, we take that knowledge and we begin to process it, and 
we realize that we begin to uh, agree and believe that these things are true. And we understand the identity of, of Jesus, who he claims to be, and how he proves his identity. And then that leads us to this deeper level of belief, which is allegiance, allegiance to following Jesus, a personal trust and commitment to him, following him in obedience to his commands, and an allegiance to his great authority. And so uh, I pray that, that today we'll go even deeper because this sign is like no other. And you see there that the believing is not the end, but it's the means to an end. The end, according to John, is life, zoe, life abundant, eternal. It means having a, an, a relationship with the one and true living God, as Jesus tells us in his prayer to the Father in John chapter 17. So as we launch into the seventh sign, I want to ask you a question. As you reflect upon your life, do you recall a time where you found yourself in a bind? We might say you were in a, in a jam or a tough spot. Or we have this phrase in our culture that says, man, I was, I was between a rock and a, a hard place. Can you think of a time where, where that was true to you? I looked up the internet, uh, some, some definitions of that idiom, in a bind. And if it's in the, in the internet, it must be correct, right? So it says, to end up in a challenging, a difficult, sometimes embarrassing or threatening situation. And you are unable to solve the dilemma by your own means. In other words, you need other people to help you. So let me, let me just share an example. Um, as Cindy and I were getting to know the, the leadership here at, at uh, Church of the City, I invited one of the pastors for lunch. And so I, I made sure that I was on time and I get halfway down the interstate. I live 22 miles from here and I was going to meet him here on campus. And I got halfway down and I started thinking, I don't feel my wallet in my back pocket. And sure enough, it wasn't there and it wasn't on the console. And I thought, oh no, this is gonna be a great first impression. Uh, here's this, this old guy that's trying to get to know us and he invites me to lunch and I gotta pay. So as I come past Titan Stadium, the word, the Lord gave me a word, Venmo, <laughs> and I was saved. <laughs> uh, so we, we get here, or I get here, and I, I ask, we'll call him Seth, because uh, that was his name. I said, Seth, you're, uh, you've probably heard this before, but I forgot my wallet, and he said, that's okay. I, I had my wallet stolen or something, but I got a card back. So, uh, so he took me to lunch, and my wife Venmoed him more than the meal before I left the property. So, you ever been in a bind? That's, now, that's an embarrassing one. That's no big deal, but let me share another one with you. Uh, a little over 14 years ago, uh, I, was, I was getting ready to leave the house, and the phone rang, and my wife answered it. And she handed it to me, and I could tell by the look on her face she was, she was a little bit upset. And she said, it's Dr. Gaddy. And so I could take you, even today, even though this was over, over 14 years ago, and I could point to the place on the, on, the, on the tile floor where I took this call. And even though he knew me personally, he said this, he says, unfortunately, sir, and I thought, you know my name. What do you, 
What's, what are you being so formal about? But he says, unfortunately, sir, I don't have good news for you. Uh, you have prostate cancer. And I promise you, the first thought I had was, so this is what it feels like. Uh, because as a pastor, I had walked with people, I had prayed with people, I had cried with people, and I had said goodbye to people that had cancer. And so, uh, you might say that I was in a bind. I was in a, I was in a hurt. And you might say it this way, that I was between a rock and a, not just a hard place, but a, but a dark place. As I reflect on these six signs that we've looked over these past six weeks, you know what I found out? Every one of them have people that are in a bind. Remember the wedding in Cana? Everybody's festive. They're having a great time. And all of a sudden, Mary finds out that the, wa that the wine is running low. And the w these weddings could last a week, and we don't know how early on it is, but it's early in the, in the wedding celebration. And so she comes to Jesus and tells him, and then she says to the, the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Not only was, was the family in a bind, the wine steward was in a bind, the couple was in a bind, but this would have been shameful for the entire village. And then you have the sign of the, the nobleman's son who, who comes from, from uh, Capernaum to, to Cana, the same place where the first miracle took place or the first sign was given about Jesus. And he says, please come. He begs him, please come back to my house for my son is about to die. Now, we don't know the background of this, but apparently... This, this man has a wife, and, and guys, think with me now. If your wife sent you on such a, an essential errand and said, bring him back, and then Jesus tells this man, uh, you, can, you can just go on home by yourself. He's healed. Can you imagine the, the turmoil within this man? He doesn't really know Jesus, but he's trusting what he says, apparently by the way he said it, and he goes back home without Jesus. He was in a bind. His wife was in a bind. The boy was in a bind. And as we walk through all of these, all of these signs, the paralytic for 38 years, he couldn't get down to the water when the angels stirred the water for, for people to be healed. He was in a bind. The feeding of the 5,000? That crowd was in a bind. The disciples were in a bind because Jesus said, well, you know, you feed them. Jesus walking on the water. When the storm came up and the disciples were in a bind because they were afraid they were going to sink. And then, as we saw last week, the man born blind. He was in a bind physically, but there was more to it than that. His I think his parents were in a bind because they were afraid to say that Jesus was the Christ and he was the one who brought his sight back because they were afraid that they'd throw them out of the synagogue. And instead, this young man got thrown out and he became a disciple of Jesus. So let's see if today's sign makes a perfect seven of these signs of people being in the bind. Now, there's increasing conflict in the life of Jesus. We haven't read chapter 10. We were in chapter 9 last week. But ever since chapter 5, there's been this growing conflict between Jesus and the leadership of the Jewish people. His bullseye is getting bigger and brighter on his back. They, they call him insane and in that he's got a demon and they've tried to stone him in the previous chapter, and now we come to chapter 11. The story takes place in a village called Bethany. Now, uh, I have a, a, 
a brief uh, photo here, as you see. You've got that green line that comes down on the northern shore of the Dead Sea. That's Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem. But he stops in Bethany. It's only a two-mile gap there between Jerusalem, which is just to the left of Bethany above the word Judea. It was a small village. Many, many scholars think it was a very poor village, but apparently it was the favorite place for Jesus when he, when he hung out in Jerusalem during the day. Perhaps he came back there and stayed at the M&M B&B, Mary and Martha's bed and breakfast. And his, his name, interestingly enough, is referred to as Lazarus in, in, in the, uh, the scriptures, but it's the, the abbreviation of Eleazar, which means God has helped or God helps. And in this story, we're going to discover how God helps this man, Lazarus. We're told that a certain man named Lazarus was sick. Literally, he, he his body was weakening and he was becoming sick. Jesus tells him this sickness is not unto it's not going to end in death but for the glory of God in order that the son of man or the son of God might be glorified in this. It's it's like the miracle last week. Jesus didn't cause that man to be blind, but in the midst of that he was going to come and glorify God by doing his work, the work of the Father in this man's life. Now, Jesus loved Martha, and John said, says it twice, that he not only loved Martha and loved Mary, but he also loved Lazarus. He was his friend, and God was going to use this for his glory. But after the courier arrives and gives him the news, and he sends him back, he waits two more days until he comes down to Bethany. It's a total of a four-day gap, and in those days, the day that someone would die, they would bury the person. And so now it's, by the time Jesus gets there, he is four days in the tomb. So I want to ask you, as we try to em embrace the story and enter into it, what kind of options did Jesus have when he was told the news of his friend being ill and dying? As I've tried to unpack this, the first one that came to me was immediately he would go. But even if he went that day, it would have taken him another day to get there because we believe that he was about 20 miles away. And so he would have died anyhow. Or he could have healed him like he did the nobleman's son on the spot just by the power of his word at a distance. That's another option. Or he could have sent his disciples and pray for this man and heal him. Or, as the option that Jesus seemed to choose, he had a plan that just doesn't make sense to us. Let's pick it up in John 17. And remember, I want you to enter into the story. I want you to identify with these people, become a part of the story. Now, when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been here, uh, been in the tomb for four days. Now, the significance of that is, is this. In the rabbinic teachings, they believed that a person's spirit or soul hovered over the dead body for three days, but on the fourth day, it would leave because the body would then begin to decompose. And so, why did John put it here? He wanted us to know he was dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. She was surrounded by, by friends and extended family consoling her in her grief. So Martha comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, before we read any further, I wonder how you see Martha. What's her face looking like to you? 
How do you hear her tone of voice? What do her eyes look like to you? Uh, I'm wondering if she came and, and buried her head in his chest and perhaps beat on his chest. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. We don't know. I don't have a video on this. But I can imagine that. How would you feel if you were Martha? But even now, she, she says, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I'm not sure what she was expecting. It, it, seems, to, it seems to indicate that perhaps she had a glimpse of, of hope even though he was dead for four days. But we'll, we'll check that in a few moments. Jesus says to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha says to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now we find in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, as, as well as other p passages in the Old Testament, that this was the Jewish understanding of the life thereafter, that we would die and then we would be all raised, those who, were, who, who lived a good life, did good deeds, uh, they lived to a life of resurrection uh, with God, and those who didn't lived with a resurrection or or they suffered everlasting disgrace apart from God. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about an end time resurrection. He was talking about a present reality, and she didn't realize that. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, and that word believe is, is in such a tense in the Greek that it means a continual belief. It's a, a lifestyle of believing in Jesus. Whoever believes continually in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes, again, continuing action, in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And... This woman comes back, this grieving woman comes back with one of the most powerful proclamations in the Bible. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe. And that particular word means that she has already believed and it has continuing effects in her life from then on. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And so she returns and goes back to Mary, and she finds Mary still being consoled by her, her friends. And she tells her, the teacher, the teacher has told me to call you. He wants to see you. And so Mary immediately jumps up and the people follow her. They think she's going to the tomb, but she's going to see Jesus, who still isn't inside the village. He's on the outskirts of the village. John says, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Have you heard that anywhere? These sisters were on the same page, weren't they? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he was, as it says, deeply moved in his spirit. Now, what do you think John means by that, deeply moved in his spirit? If you're somewhat like me in your thought process and, and you've been to the site of grieving families, you think of the words compassion. You think of, of, of grief, of, of loss, of, of empathy perhaps. But that's not the word that John uses here. It's embrimaomai. Now, try that one sometime and just put it in a sentence this week, see how it works out. Embrimaomai. 
It's a word that means it's an outrage of, of anger and fury. In, in classical Greek of the day, the same time period as, as the Bible was written, it means the, the snort of a, of a horse. Those of you that love to be around horses, you've probably heard them snort. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a release of anger and outrage. To be incensed or indignant about something that, that breaks your heart. So I wonder, what, what makes you angry? What makes you outraged at such a deep level? We were on our honeymoon, and my wife and I were traveling up through Georgia. We were, we were married in Florida, so we were driving up through Georgia, and we stopped at a place called uh, Six Flags over Georgia. You know, it's an amusement park, and we were just going to have some fun and enjoy. It was a beautiful day, and we, we, got, some, we got some lunch at uh, this, little, this little place that was near one of the attractions, and we sat down at a picnic table, and barely did we begin, and all of a sudden, this mother grabbed her, her daughter by, by the hand and started to scream at her, berating her, demeaning her. And, and all I could, my skin was crawling. And it was very embarrassing because everybody, she, 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 it was like she was at home alone. She was shouting and couldn't care less about us. That happened over 40 years ago, and I still remember the feeling of, of deep anger within me. I just, I just wanted to go over and, and, and take it away to, to say, what are you doing? As I watch the, as I watch the scenes on the, on the evening news that you and I have seen either on a computer screen or a television, I just want to stop it. I can't, I can't handle what's happening to the people of Ukraine. Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit. Now, why was that emotion coming out of him as he was seeing this scene of grief and, and death I think, I think it has something to do with what John said at the very beginning of his gospel. In chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, he says this. And just, just listen to this. God created everything through him, meaning Jesus. And nothing was created except through him. The word, the logos, the governing principle of the universe, i.e., God... God gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The very life of Jesus brought light to all of us. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. I think Jesus was so angry, angry because he is the, here he is, the author of all creation, in front of the very handiwork of Satan himself. Death, darkness, and destruction is in front of him, and he is livid. And then there's a little tagline here, and he's greatly troubled. Well, that's a different word. And it means to be stirred or shaken. I have a hunch that if you're like me, there are some things that, that stir you and, and shake you. That's what Jesus felt. Those words are, are used by John to describe the way that Jesus described his emotion when he knew that his hour had come for him to be killed. He said, my soul is troubled, same word. My soul is, the weight of this is, is, is bearing down on me. When he knew that he would be betrayed, John describes Jesus as being troubled in his spirit. 
You ever been betrayed by someone? Jesus can identify with you. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the Bible verse that you and I have memorized is, Jesus wept. By the way, uh, that's not the shortest verse in the Greek Bible, okay? It's rejoice always. That may get you a free cup of coffee somewhere. See how he loved him. Jesus loved this man, and so he wept. And when you think about it, the God of all creation is now releasing his, his emotions in front, of, in front of these people. His own creation is being destroyed by the enemy, but he came there as a sign let me show you what Jesus encountered when he came to Lazarus' tomb. Here's a picture of a Rolling Stone tomb. I've had the privilege of being in Israel some 30 years ago and, and walking inside there. Now, obviously, the, the stone is in a channel or, or a, uh, a track, and you can roll it back and forth and then put a stone in front of it to lock it up. Now, let's go inside. This is a, a graphic that we have that shows us what it looks like inside. They have a place where the body is prepared and wrapped in, in linen. He's on a, on a uh, preparation slab. And then what happens is they will place the, the body head first into one of those areas under the letter F. It's, it's like a, a shaft or a channel that's cut out of the cave and they place people inside that for their body to decompose. That's where we think Lazarus was. Let me show you an actual picture of a, of a tomb. You see those three, those three dark spots go into the rock. And apparently he was prepared for burial. And now it's the fourth day. He's back. They placed him back in there and rolled the stone in front of the tomb. And let me show you just a graphic of, that's how they would put them in head first and just let their body decompose. About a year later, they would come, and then they would take the bones of the person and put them in a stone box called an ossuary and then recycle that tomb because these were very infrequent and very expensive for people. That's where we find Jesus. And it says, Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Could Jesus not have just made the stone disappear or busted it into a bunch of pebbles? Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. If you're a King James reader, you know that it says, he stinketh. <laughs> For he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes toward heaven. Now he's praying out loud, so not so God can hear him, but so the people can hear him. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you've always heard hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these words, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Literally, come out! Come out of the domain of darkness. You weren't meant to be here. You were made to live and walk in the light. Uh, St. Augustine said that if Jesus hadn't have called Lazarus by name, the power of his voice would have raised everybody out of their tombs that day. But specifically, he called Lazarus. The Apostle Paul reflects on this, this experience of darkness and what took place visually to those people, in front of those people. He puts it this way. He says that you and I have been transferred 
from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, his beloved son. That's what's happened to those of us who have said, Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm following you. I want, you're my king. And I believe you have life to give me. And so, the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus was in a bind. But he just wasn't between a rock and a hard place. He was between a rock and a very dark place. And Jesus brought him back. Now, I don't, I don't know how he got out of that tomb, out of that, that coke that they call that shaft. I don't know how he got out of there. But he's standing in the presence of the light of the world. And Jesus says, hey, you guys, unbind him as command. Unbind him and then let him go. It's the same word that, that is used for the word forgive. We, we let go. We unwrap that stuff and let it go. So the question is, why did Jesus allow or invite people to, to join him in this in this sign, in this miraculous sign. Well, in, it's not the first time that he's done it in our, in our studies. In, in John 2, he, he had people at the, at the wedding in Cana to, to help pour the water in the pots and then to serve the wine. He did it at the feeding of the 5,000 plus when he had the disciples participate in the miracle. Paul says it this way, that we are co-workers or co-laborers with Jesus or with God. He invites us to join him in his mission of, of redemption and reconciliation. So this seventh sign is not simply about a physical, a physical death and future resurrection. It is an image of those of us who are between a rock and a dark place in terms of our spiritual lives. He's calling, he's calling us out of darkness into the light of life. And if you think I'm maybe spiritualizing this, watch this. In John 5, 25, here's what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's talking about people that are living and breathing, but spiritually dead. And if we hear his voice, we can have life. So what does it mean that, that Jesus is the resurrection and life? Let me just summarize it this way in my feeble attempt to do so. Death does not have the last word. Jesus does. The grave is not our goal. Jesus is our goal. To have that experience of victory over death and darkness and despair can become a present reality when we're walking and following Jesus. Would you take out your communion elements, please? And as we think about that Passover meal, Jesus was meeting with his disciples. It's a meal that we celebrate this Thursday, just before Good Friday. He said, this is my body, which is, which is given for you. As often as you take this, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. And then at the conclusion of the meal, our Lord took the cup, the cup of redemption in the Passover meal. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. If you have your formation journals, you may want to jot down some reflection questions that I 
have for us before we conclude. This, this story has so much to offer to us. So as you consider your spiritual journey, my friend, uh, which side of the stone are you on currently? Are you bound in darkness or are you walking in the light? Through a number of God-ordained circumstances in my life and in the midst of my denial and deception and defiance, uh, I realized that I was in a hell of a bind. I was walking in darkness and bound in deception. You might say I was between a rock and a truly dark, dark place. But God used a variety of people in my life to roll away the stone so I could hear the words, Denny, come out. You were made for more than this. What grave clothes still need to be unbound from your life in your journey with Jesus? And then who might assist you in this? You know, um, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't have anybody explain this, this whole discipleship journey. I thought once you said yes, that that was it. In fact, I'll, about an hour after I made my decision to follow Jesus in, in the way that I understood it, I asked the people that I was with, am I ever going to sin again? And they said, well, we'll give you a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's a battle. We don't come out perfect of this, of this journey. We begin with promise and hope because of him and the strength that he gives us. But I needed people to unbind me those, of those wraps of of sinful habits and behaviors and addictions and painful memories that plagued me even as an adult. Let me just remind you, church, that we're offering an incredible opportunity that Pastor Matt talked about a few moments ago, that this emo emotionally healthy spirituality class, this will be a safe place, hear me, a safe place for you to have loving and gifted people assist you in unbinding, in the process of unbinding you from your grave clothes. And then, who do you know in your life that needs the stone rolled away? Who has God placed across your path? Discipleship is not simply about Jesus and me and how I'm doing with Jesus, but it's how I'm living and serving others that he's brought across my path, my family, my, my, my church family. My, my friends, my network, the people that I live, work, play, study, and, and shop with, all those people. What is God doing in me to, to reach them? They need to hear the voice of Jesus, and they need things rolled away so they can hear clearly in a relationship of love and authenticity. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation to bring people back to God. And then finally, how might you come alongside to help them, to help unbind them so they can walk in the light of God's freedom and truth? Just last night, I came across a quote that I want to share with you. It's from a guy named C.S. Lewis. He knew Jesus pretty well, and it, it fits so perfectly in, this, in this, uh, this chapter that we're looking at, this sign. He says, we are not necessarily doubting that God will be, that God will do the best for us. We're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best for us will turn out to be. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for this story. Thank you for John. Thank you for his obedience and listening to your spirit to record this incredible uh, visual as a preface to what happens next Sunday. And just as you stood in front of his tomb, Jesus, one day you're going to stand in front of ours as we, as we appear before you. 
Thank you that you're the resurrection and the life. And that you've called us to come alongside people in our everyday world to give them hope, to give them assurance of your love and to serve them and love them into your kingdom. We bless you and we thank you for your scriptures. We pray this in Christ's name. Cause death could not hold the veil tore before you You silence the bones of sin and grave The heavens are roaring the praise of your glory For you are raised to life again You have no right Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. And death could not, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and for Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand again. What a powerful name it is, the name. Sing, you have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the Lazarus was raised from the dead, and after four days of mourning, it turned to dancing. But then we get to verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, 
everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. And down to verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Today's Palm Sunday, where Jesus had the triumphal entrance into Jerusalem with people yelling Hosanna. Very quickly, those yells changed to crucify him. I encourage you uh, to lean in this Holy Week. If you, if you have a formation uh, journal, and even if you don't, we have some available at the back. We will guiding, we'll be guiding you uh, carefully each day through uh, curated Bible verses to stay connected uh, with the journey of Jesus. It's unwise to move straight uh, from Palm Sunday to the resurrection. There's some sadness ahead. Uh, on Friday, this room will be transformed into a, an environment where we believe you will be deeply moved as you connect with the sadness of the crucifixion. I encourage you to come on Good Friday. And then on next Sunday, again, the, the morning turns to dancing. We encourage you to join us um, for the greatest Sunday of the year, Resurrection Sunday. Guys, we love you. Thankful that you'd uh, spend time with us on a Sunday morning. And would you go in peace? Bye for now.